Hey guys, Brett Scholl here, uh, here with Guitar.com Live. Hi, Tim Pierce here with Guitar.com Live. Also excited. <laughs> yeah, man. So today we're talking about uh, great guitar tone in the studio. And really, I'm I'm actually I think just here to listen to what you have to say on this because <laughs> you've got a you've got a, a lifetime more experience in this than I do. So, yeah. Okay, but for, <laughs> before. <laughs> You're, you're actually so good. Your videos are so good about all this stuff that I would beg to differ. But uh, on that same subject, I haven't watched your Dumble video yet. Can you just tell me what that experience was like for you real quick before we start? Yeah, so I started a new series on my channel. Uh, I'm I'm still workshopping the name a little bit. I'm actually in the middle of working on a video in the in the series right now. It's basically the series is what is the sound? So what is the Dumble sound? The second video is what is the orange sound? Today I'm doing what is the PAF sound. And essentially it's sort of a history sort of mini documentary about where these things came from and the people that created them and the people that played them. And then exploring like what these sounds actually are, what is the Dumble sound and what makes it so sought after and unique. And then kind of covering how you can get that sound at home with some gear that you might already have in the Dumble case without spending $125,000 on an amplifier. Did you love the Dumble? I just, I didn't watch the video yet. So was I it did. amazing? Yeah. So it's, it's a clone. It's behind me here. It's Oh, uh, that's okay. So I thought maybe you borrowed a Dumble no. from a friend. Okay. It's a clone. I don't know. I, I, the only Dumbles I know of are out near you on the West coast, <laughs> which I don't have access to. So I used a clone uh, from a guy named Taylor who builds them in, um, in Boston. This company's called Amplified Nation. And it's, it's killer, man. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about direct recording, because that's something I don't do a lot of. I, I love the devices I own. I own the Axe Effects. I own the Kemper. I own the Aux. And <clears throat> I love Line 6. I love the people there, but I don't own a Helix as of yet. You have actually vetted all of them. <clears throat> yeah. And I, I like the three that I own. I love them for different reasons. I mean, the Axe Effects is a huge engine and the effects are amazing. Uh, the Kemper is very convenient and easy. It's kind of just, it's like, it's, to me, it's like the pod I used to use. Yep. And then the Aux is crazy because I just did a video with Jeff Mackerlane and he, he gets the most amazing sound out of his aux. The aux, you really have to mother the amp and do some crazy EQs on it sometimes. But the thing I love about the aux is you can take the amp that you love, that you cherish, and use it. Yes. And that's a big deal. That's a really yeah. big deal. I think direct recording, it's, it's primarily what I use now. So for this video that I'm working on, I just recorded a track for the intro. And... I recorded it all direct. I was using the um, the UA stuff, the, their amp sim, so like their blues breaker sim, their tweed sim. And uh, in the context of a mix, no matter what you're talking about, if it's a Kemper, a Helix, an Axe Effects, the Aux, a Torpedo, whatever it is, I think in the context of a mix now, if it's recorded well and if it's mixed well, you really can't tell the difference between an actual amp mic'd up in a room and some kind of digital direct solution. Um, yeah, it's, it's gotten really, really good uh, of all the different stuff. I think it's really down to a point. It's, it's less about what sounds best and it's more about what works for your workflow the best, you know, things like the ax effects sound incredible. They are a little bit more complicated. You know, if you're coming from like a traditional tube amp kind of setup, I, I actually think the Kemper is the easiest transition to make because it's set up most like an actual tube amp but you were talking about the aux a second ago i think things like that those amp top attenuator di boxes whether it's the aux or the captor x from two notes to me those are the best thing because you get your real deal tube amp that you know and love you know how to use it you know what works well but you can actually, especially if you've got a higher wattage amp, if you've got a hundred watt Marshall or even a 50 watt amp, you can, you can push it to where it wants to be and play or record silently, which I think is amazing. It is amazing because I, I was able to build a vault in my garage where I have four twelves running at stadium volume. You've seen it. 
Yeah. Um, I've been in but it. <laughs> you've been in it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but the, the, the most people don't have that luxury. You know, they have, <clears throat> they, maybe they have a, a home, they have a family, but they can't spend all that money on a soundproof enclosure. They can't dig a hole in the backyard. They can't build an extra room. And so for me, it's very freeing for, for guitar players. It's liberating to be able to live anywhere yeah. and, and be able to get those sounds. So when you're recording at home, are you, are you using stuff like the aux or are you still using your cabs mic'd up in your vault downstairs? I flirt with all these devices because I love them. And more than that, I love the people who make them. I mean, just like you, I know the people who make these devices and they work so hard and they're constantly making them better and they're developing these things. <clears throat> I, I love the whole idea of this technology, but for me, I still hear a small difference. And my job was always to exist in the area above 95% or 99%. Um, so it's that last, those last few inches of tone for me are still where I try and live. Now, I agree that you can't tell anymore if a digital device is being used or an analog device. But part of that is we've gotten so used to the digital delivery systems for finished product and finished music. Yeah. We listen on digital platforms that kind of make those that those last few inches kind of disappear. I mean, there is a <clears throat> a top end with distorted guitar that still gets a little pixelated with these digital devices. Um, let me put my headphone back in. I don't mind that. It sounds modern to me, but because I have this old school thing still set up, I still gravitate towards it. It's really, it's really the top end. There's a, still a little bit of hashiness when I hear multiple guitar parts that are modeled or done with, with direct devices. Right. It's uh, cumulative. Don't get, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it sounds modern. It's the way of the future. I know that, you know that. And the great thing about it, it puts the sounds right in your face. A direct right. guitar is always just right in your face. So that's, that's a really great thing. But because I built a room and I still have the setup and I have the microphones, I live in that world and I flirt with the other devices. I love them and I have no problem with, you know, two years from now, game over. <laughs> it's, it's been, you know, it's been completely matched by, you know, these, yeah. these devices. Well, if you decide to uh, to move on from any of your mics or cabinets, please let me know. I will gladly take them off your hands and give them a new home. <laughs> um, we're, I'm kind of in that same process right now. My wife and I are looking at homes, and that's something that I want to do is build a setup pretty pretty similar to yours in terms of having a, an isolated space that is separate from the living space that I can have my cabinets run and be able to run them at full volume because you know, for, for me, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's more about where I want to go with my work. Like everything I do now pretty much is all YouTube. And when you're recording something and uploading it to YouTube in a video, a 1080p video or 4k video, that five to 10% that you're talking about, I mean, you know, this, it gets completely obliterated by the compression algorithm on YouTube. Right. And so you can't really tell the, the nuances between an ox or the real cabinet, you know, but if you're in the room, I, you're right. That, that sort of cumulative top end harshness can, can come out. If you don't know, if you're not prepared for it, if you're not EQing for it, if you're not, uh, you, you know, uh, playing for it, it, it can get out of hand pretty quick, I think. Well, and we've listened to that kind of sound, that harshness, for a number of years now and arguably we've accepted it and it actually sounds kind of modern so mm. i recognize that that the actual that's that slight bit of harshness on a guitar tone we're used to it now and it sounds modern so you know i don't have a problem with it either but in the environment we live in uh, the sounds we get are amazing it's when we release it you know when we send that that kind of shrunken digital you know product out that it suffers I want to ask you something. Um, I think you're just like me. Every amp you use is not the most distorted amp in the world. It, it's a it's an amp that actually has a sweet spot. And, yep. and what what we try and do is find the place on the amp where it begins to bloom and compress, and then you light it up with pedals. 
I can't really do better than that these days. And it's pretty simple, but it, it's kind of, you know, it's hard on the ego sometimes if you spend a lot of money on an app and you realize there's only one setting <laughs> that it sounds good at. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you're right. It's, um, you know, it's, and it's different, you know, we're talking in the context of a recording situation, not a gigging situation. I think gigging out and playing shows is, is a different thing where you can kind of fudge it a little bit. Like, okay, I have this one amp and during the course of a show, it needs to cover a great clean tone, a great rhythm, bite tone, a great high gain tone, ambient. Like you have to cover all that stuff in the context of recording at home or in the studio. You're right. You kind of, you find the right tool for the job and what happens is you start to you know collect different amps that all i see i see you know everyone's pretty familiar with your setup over there um you get these amps that do the one thing really really well and you you spend all this money on an amp that does that thing um really really well but again when you're you know what you were just talking about you exist especially you exist in that 95th to 98th percentile right that's why you got you've been hired so many times for all these iconic records is because you know how to take the gear and, and the stuff that you have to that that top level you know yeah and and i recognize that it's a different world now and i i'm, I'm really all for it i mean i i believe everybody should have access to great tone at an affordable price because a lot of our heroes they walked into a music store they grabbed the guitar off the wall they bought it they grabbed the amp that was sitting they bought it and they made history and it shouldn't be out of reach it right. never was before it should be affordable but it's it, the thing is if you find an amp that you really love you can use it for the rest of your life so if you spend two grand on that amp that's a lifetime uh, investment. I, I mean, so I have amps that I use, I'll use forever. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. My, uh, we have a, a mutual love for divided yeah, by 13 yeah. for Fred to yeah. my FTR 37. That is a, that's a lifetime amp for me. And then I've got an RSA 23 out there that actually you turned me on to like a year or so ago. Um, and that's one of those, it's a desert Island amp. Both of those are desert island amps same thing with like you know the the high watts for example the what they're doing now with the new high watts reissues over in um in england they're incredible man yeah, like yeah. that custom 20 right there is one of my favorite amps that's another lifetime amp for me i know? want one i'm, I'm jealous because the high watt the look of the high watt was is the most iconic military it looks like a piece of military gear from the 50s oh yeah abs a british military <laughs> issue gear from the 50s and I just love, I just love the way it looks, and I'm, I'm sure that amp sounds great. I, yeah, I would say never be afraid to spend big money on an amp mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it is a bit a roll of the dice. But over a lifetime, if you end up with three or four of them, they all, they'll serve. You, I mean, they just serve you so well. You don't, have, you know, once you find one that you love, you can find another one that you love. But the pressure's off at that point. Yeah, you know, right. Really it's pretty easy. So do you believe in, in, you know, as a session player for so long, do you believe in like, um, finding, you know, everyone has to have a few sort of bass sounds, right? Like if you're going to work professionally, you have to have a, a Vox sound, a Fender sound, a Marshall sound, or was it more like you found your amp and your rig and then you got hired because it was your sound? That's a great question because it used to be one way and now it's another way. In the 90s, everybody was really tuned in to the, to the absolute differences between a Marshall and a Vox and a Fender. And you really did. I used to come in with an arsenal, you know, a truck with I'd bring eight different amplifiers and different cabinets and 40 guitars and three pedal boards. And then prior to that, that was the rack era. But that was kind of a. Uh, we got sidetracked by that because those sounds were not that great. It was just the rack era was just about making people feel confident when you were tracking and giving this wide stereo image. That was, you know, I'm glad that ended. You know, it took it took a while for it to end. But we went back to mono amps kind of in the early 90s when Nirvana showed up. And that was a great thing. 
So in the 90s, if I showed up for a session, the producer and the engineer had huge prejudices about seeing a Vox and a Fender and, and, and hearing those differences. One of the nice things about today is that people have given up the origin of the sound and they're only interested in a sound. Mm. They honestly don't care anymore how you create that sound. And that's really liberating. Because a lot of the producers I work with now, I just bring the stuff in my car, and it's usually one amp. It might be my divided by, thir by 13. They never even ask. They, they, they want to make the song, and, the, and it's about the, this whole... They hear your tone, and they go, ah, oh, there yeah. it is. They right. never even ask. And it's so great, because I lived with that that thing of, you know, well, I couldn't afford a real 335 from the era, so I'd, I'd get a reissue and hope that they wouldn't say, what year is that thing? <laughs> it was brutal. It was just brutal, you know? Wow. Yeah, that's... Obviously, I don't have this, the level of experience that you do, but in, in my experience playing sessions, it's never been like that. I don't think I've ever walked into a situation and had somebody, like, vibe me because of what amp or, or rig that I brought, you know, <laughs> it's, it's been that thing that you described like, Hey, cool. Yeah. Can you get me in it? And they're more so describing sounds and, in, in sort of individual and esoteric ways. And it's up to you to kind of, uh, decipher what they're saying and how you can get that sound out of the gear that you brought. You are absolutely right. And with an amp that is healthy sounding and not too distorted, and a pedal board with well-chosen pedals. I mean, all you have to do is follow your heroes, follow the people that are at, at the front edge of this thing, like like our friend Tom Bukovac. I mean, mm -hmm. I got my first Nobles ODR-1 from John Shanks. It had been given to John by Bukovac, and John gave it to me. And I've used that pedal as my primary source of, you know, high, not high gain, but almost high gain, like for ever since. Right. And it was a gift to him and a gift to me. And I read about Tom when he found he found like a somebody who had, you know, dozens of these things. He bought them and just started giving them out to his friends. And so if you follow people like that, you don't have to you don't have to make the mistakes and waste the money on stuff that's almost there. Sometimes it's hard to go, OK, I'm just going to copy those pedals on his pedal board. But right. I would rather be second in line at this point and go, oh, that's what he's using. I want to get one of those. Like I have this Ebo reverb back here, which is probably the most expensive spring reverb in the world. Tom said, uh, hey, you need to check this out. And I heard a little clip of him using it. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to give myself a gift. I'm going to grab this thing. And right. it creates... It takes your guitar and creates this pillow around it. it. It's almost like you don't even hear the reverb. You just hear the tone get sweeter. It's so, <laughs> and that's just taking somebody's advice, you know, right. and, and, and taking a leap of faith. And so I love to be second or third. I love to find out what you're using and go, oh, that Rhett got an amazing sound out of that and just go get it. Well, that's, I I've been in that, that role and I'm still in that role of like looking up to guys like you and, and Bukovac and, and John Shanks and, and all these guys, um, around Nashville and, and LA, because you know, y'all for, for guitar players, y'all are like the cutting edge. You guys are the trendsetters and have been the trendsetters for a long time. You know, it's like trickles down, right? Like the sounds that you get in the studio on these records and these big records, they trickle down to guys like me that are playing with smaller artists and smaller producers and referencing those records that you, that you played on. Um, and so with that in mind, like what, what do you, so the ODR one has, you're right. I think has become like a staple in the session man kind of scene. You know, it's almost every pedal board I've seen around Nashville, yeah. everyone's got an ODR one like reissue or an original one or whatever. So what are some of those things some of those staple pieces of gear for you that, that you wouldn't show up to a session without. Uh, my pedal board's in the garage, so I'm going to recreate it from memory. But I use a, a MXR micro ramp, and the version I use is the cleaned up version, 
Custom Audio Electronics Boost Line Driver. It's a one knob thing that just pushes the front end of the amp. The, the gain pedals that I love are just things that explode the input of the amp. Okay, the other thing I use is a Mostortion, which I discovered late. So about two years ago, I grabbed the last six Mostortions on the planet that were available at that time. And uh, that was after another guitar player I know in Nashville, who will remain nameless, apparently has 22 of them. <laughs> 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 However, I have a friend who has cloned it absolutely. It's called the Karma Pedal. My friend Greg Droman, D-R-O-M-A-N. And it's an absolute clone. So at this point, I would not look for uh, an ODR one from the early 90s because they really do sound different than the, the reissues are wonderful. It's still a wonderful company, but there's a slight difference between the reissues and the, the ODR one. I'm still waiting for a clone of that. You let me know when you find it. Rhett, OK, well, I'm, I'm I'm thinking I might have to, like, reach out to some pedal builder friends of mine and, and see if we can commission it. Maybe it'll be for like me, you and <laughs> a couple yeah. other people, you know, we'll just get a couple out there. OK, so I use a, a tr I always have a tremolo. I mean, for me, a good trick is just to play a one chord and have it have it like in a slow triplet fashion undulate. OK, yep. so it has to be a tremolo that has a really soft kind of, you know wavy sound to it. This MXR reverb behind me, it's a little black pedal. I wonder if I can get it in here without pulling it out. I can't, it's kind of hooked up back here. Little black MXR reverb is a great one for your pedal board. The great thing about today is that people love when you print reverb. That was, it was forbidden for like two decades when I was working. They wanted to have control over that, but now I can actually print reverb 100% of the time. It's yeah. amazing, I love it. So tremolo reverb, I use the H9 because it's a really, really high fidelity pedal that when you combine it with your lo-fi analog pedals, it's a really nice balance. Um, it's probably, oh, I like the Echo Park because I, I get great infinite delays out of the Line 6 Echo Park. It's really yeah. musical when you use a volume pedal and just let it sustain forever. Um, there's lots of them. Uh, that's a few of them. The reverb thing is interesting. The printing reverb thing. I've always printed my reverbs, um, and I've I've always been pretty adamant on sessions that I've played about not doing things like, um, especially when it's something that I'm producing or or playing on or writing on. I never record a DI track. I never do anything for reamping because for me, I think it's really important from a creative perspective to commit in the moment. Like, come up with your sound, come up with your part and commit and um because what happens is especially with the modelers and stuff one of the downsides is you can really fall into the option paralysis thing right you have when you have access to basically every sound that you would ever need as a guitar player sometimes it can be pretty difficult to try and find what the actual sound is and i fall victim to sitting down here and and just messing around with settings and presets and stuff longer than i am actually playing so uh, from that perspective, I always like to kind of keep it simple and and commit to a part and a sound. Is that still how you do it, or is there is yeah, that? I, I'm, I, yeah, I'm going to take it a step further, and you'll understand because I'm sure you've experienced it. The people that hire me barely have time to get on the phone and ask me to do the session. The people that hire me, they don't want options because they have a hundred other things to do to get their job done. So they want me to send them the right thing finished. And yeah. that includes all the effects. And it includes, you know, I mean, if you want to give them some options on a part, that's fine too. But that's, I would rather have them ask for revisions after the fact so that I don't spend a minute of my time giving them something that they don't use. I'd rather have, have them ask for it after the fact. So <clears throat> I agree with you. And at this point, you are producing and arranging a guitar arrangement when you deliver your parts. And that needs to be a finished thing. And the same thing goes in the studio. People are moving so fast that they want, they want the sound and they want it finished. So yes, give them no options. I think that's an... Oh, that's one other thing. Hold, I'm sorry to interrupt you. There's one thing. When I play a solo... This is the one exception. When I play a solo, I love to have delay, but I don't want to print that delay. 
Mm. I want them to have the option to have it bone dry or a little delay or a little more delay. That's that's the one situation. Now you don't deliver a lot of solos to people, but I always, you know, I always do it with Echo Boy in the in the actual DAW so that it's negotiable. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think I think that's that's probably uh you're probably right on that because as guitar players we we tend to find our comfort zone. <laughs> I'm the same way with reverb. I love reverb and oftentimes I love too much reverb for what the mix of the part actually calls for. Uh, so on a solo specifically. So yeah, I've, I've learned to do that. Just pull up a reverb and a delay in your, in your uh, DAW and then you can give them whatever they want with that kind of stuff. But with the effects and, and everything, you and I've talked about this before. It's like a lot of times the effect will inform the part that you're playing and it's, it's like the edge school, right? Where, you may, if you take away all of the sonic uh, sort of embellishments that are going on and you just examine the guitar part, a lot of times it's oversimplified. But when you when you take in everything else that's going on, it's the right part and the right sound for the song. And so I don't think, yeah, it's, it's in that context, I don't think it's a good idea to give options for that kind of stuff. Yes, and, and you're right. Everything you have in your hands, everything you're using informs the part. Like a particular guitar, if it's hard to play, you're going to play a different part. If the strings are heavy, you're going to play a different part. If you have it on the neck pickup, you're going to play a different part. You're right. Everything informs the part. And so it really, it can't be reverse engineered. I had one record I did where I was playing these background parts and the mixer actually pushed them way out in front and it was i was horrified because they were meant to be just back here just floating and it was like ah, there's nothing in that situation i mean the thing about guitar session work is that you never experience the glory of the original mix because you got it up really right loud and yep. then they always have to bring it back so that they can make room for other stuff i got used to that a long time ago but um, I know you still have a big live uh, kind of component to your um, career in addition to YouTube and sessions. And so you have a lot of valuable information to share about that. I mean, I don't when I show up somewhere to play live, I just I kind of do what you were talking about. I, I just find an app that's going to be the right volume for mm. The band, uh, but what I do one thing, I you know I set it for rhythm, but I make sure that I have a pedal that allows me to play louder than the drummer when I do solos. Yep. Because when you take a solo and it sounds skinny and weak, it's it's not good for anybody. I mean, when you step on a pedal to take a solo, that pedal needs to catapult you to a level above the volume of the drums. So that's the one thing I, I always have done live. Uh, yep. That's what I love about preamp pedals and boost pedals. Preamp pedals specifically because a lot of times they'll give you EQ options and you can use that for that very purpose. That can be your solo pedal where you're you're pushing a little bit more of the low mid range and and you know like the 3 to 5k mid range area to kind of really help cut through in the mix. The thing I've learned from playing live uh, and playing a lot of like small clubs and things like that, especially when you're not playing with the same front of house engineer every night, you know, the, the person mixing the front of house oftentimes doesn't know your songs and quite frankly, doesn't care. <laughs> so they don't know when you're going to step out and take a solo. They don't know your arrangements or any, so it's up to you essentially to mix yourself and it's up to the band in, in some ways to mix themselves, the vocalists to know when to, you know, be on a mic and, and back off and everything. And so from a rig perspective, from a guitar setup perspective, I like to bring an amp that is slightly overpowered for the venue because I can, I can have that option of, of, of getting, you know, cause a lot of times the parts that I'll take may not be a, or the solos I take may not be like a lead sound. I might want a clean ish sound that steps forward and so having an amp that has the headroom to be able to do that is is great it's what i love about that ftr it's 37 watts but it's the loudest 37 watt amp i've ever heard in my life it sounds like 100 watts in some cases you know but you know playing in a lot of those clubs that amp lets me step forward and get the tone that i want at the level 
that's needed. And then, you know, you can back it off, roll off your volume knob, play softer to clean it up and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's a, it's a whole nother, other, a whole nother world playing live, man. Well, that's, that's really valuable information. What you just said to anybody, you know, when things open up again, uh, playing live. And I realized the same thing. As much as I love the sound of a sweet 18 watt amp, I realized that in order to get on a stage, I had to have 30 watts, mm. basically. You know, as a general rule for that exact reason. And the other thing is you want your clean tones to be healthy. Yes. They have to, they, they can't, they can't be too small. So I came to the same conclusion. Yeah. I think, I think 20, anywhere the in 20 to 30 Watts is good for 90% of, of gigs that you're going to play as a guitar player. Um, you know, and, and the thing going back to like the ox, and the, the Captor X kind of discussion is now you can actually get away with taking a 50 or hundred watt amp out now because you can have that attenuation and you can go direct out. That's, that's my biggest, uh, my plan for this year. I had two live rigs set up, ready to go for this year. Um, I had several tours lined up and a bunch of festival dates lined up for the summer. And so my festival rig was going to be the Axe FX three, because if you, if you've ever played festivals, you know, that it's, you're flying by the seat of your pants, like white knuckling the whole time. Pure adversity. It's oh, pure yeah. adversity. Yeah. 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 It's, it's about reliability and getting your sounds up and quick. And in that context, modelers, in my opinion, are king. When you have 10 minutes to get your gear on stage, to get set up, get line checked and sound checked before you start playing it the modeler is hard to beat man because you have all your sounds you have everything you just flip it on and go so my my uh my festival rig was going to be that and then my um club rig was going to be the rsa 23 with its 212 but maybe they'll have to wait till next year <laughs> yeah it'll, it'll 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 just be patient it'll be back soon i have one kind of last question for you and this this might you know be something for everybody. You're looking for a new environment, and what is your dream environment? I mean, you may have to compromise. You may not. Uh, is it going to be two rooms, two big rooms, two small rooms, a basement, a separate building? What's what are you what are you seeking? I have a plan. Uh, my wife and I have a plan. So it's a multi-phase sort of plan. Phase one is getting a home with a basement um, that's big enough to have a modest sized live room enough for a four piece band, because that's a big part of what I'm doing right now are these like live stream shows on my YouTube channel from a basement setup. Um, and I'd like to have a separate control room and live room and at least one isolated maybe closet or something to put some cabinets in. Um, phase two would be, uh, I have some friends in Nashville that have done this maybe on the property in the backyard, building a one story or two story standalone building, which is larger live room, larger, more for full featured control room with a vocal booth with another ISO booth, that kind of thing. Um, I, I really like having a separate work environment from the home if you can help it because it just, I find that you work better. You work more productively when you go to a different place that isn't your house and your kitchen and your bedroom and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the goal. That's an awesome dream. I, I think you'll, you'll get there. So you, you actually would use the basement, build it out and then start building the other dream, which would be a a building in the backyard and then you would have two studios <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i could pick which studio i wanted to use <laughs> well the, the good thing about like live rooms is they make uh you can turn them into great like home theaters because all the you know the acoustic treatment stuff's already right. there and uh, you know if you put up a, a modest little sound system and a screen then there you go you got a great little home theater set up you know well we don't uh we don't have many basements out here on the west coast i've, I've always been jealous of that it's uh, i love basements and uh, so I had to find a house. It was hard for me too when we bought this house 11 years ago. 
I had to find a house with a big bonus room because I didn't want to convert a garage. I actually wanted a room with windows. I also right. didn't want to spend on the conversion. Garage conversions are expensive. The, the soundproofing is really expensive. So I actually, we, I spent a whole year. And I knew the whole inventory of every house in the neighborhoods I was seeking. And we finally bought a house that was a little too big because it had this bonus room. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Best of luck on your search. I know, I know you'll find something nice soon. It's it's been a, an emotional roller coaster, <laughs> um, but on that, like I did want to ask about your your vault specifically. Have you run into any any sort of um, issues with EQing or anything like that? Having the cabinets in a closed off sort of isolated space down there, or is it is it like it's in a big room? It is not as big as a big room. I mean, excuse me. It is not as good as a big room. Uh, one of the things that I do, I learned from a friend of mine, Doug McKean, who engineered American Idiot by Green Day, won a Grammy for that and all this other stuff. Um, Doug, when we record, we go to a studio and we're in a, a booth, basically. He puts a packing blanket over the cabinet and over the microphone like a tent. And what that does, the thing is, even if my vault is big, it's plenty big, but there's still so much bottom end that gets created by the environment. That bottom end, even even in a 57, it comes back and gets into the 57 that's right in front of the cabinet. So what happens is you end up with something that sounds really full and thick. And, mm. and at first you go, oh, this is amazing. This is fat sounding. But what it's really doing, it's clouding the upper mids and the top end. Right. So it is not the greatest environment. The best environment is the biggest room you can possibly have. Right. And there, there is a difference. That top end, it, the, the the bottom end doesn't come back and load up. Now I've I've got I've got packing blankets down there. I aim the cabinets a certain way. I put other stuff in the environment. There are way I have fixed it, mostly, with these tricks. And as long as you use some of these tricks, you know, you can get away with it. And frankly, in a lot of the greatest studios, they stick the guitar cabinets in a closet anyway, and it sounds fine. So, right. you know, but the true answer to your question is that it does not, even my vault that I treasure and love and is wonderful. It does not sound as good as a large room. Yep. Okay. Good to know. Well, thanks, Tim. Thank it's you. Been, uh, a good excuse to get on and talk about about some gear. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's inspiring, man. I love, love watching your videos and uh yeah. Well, likewise, man. Uh we've talked about this before, but uh you are a you are a personal hero of mine. So anytime we get to chat, it's it's an honor. So, thanks, man. I look forward to the day when we can stand out there by the pool at the Sheridan. Oh my god. Am. Yes. <laughs> Not this year, but hey, maybe uh maybe next year we'll we'll finally get get able to get the pool hang back together and get the whole crew yeah, together yeah. out there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks. George. Thanks man. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>